Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Vallabhi Jalan, the convener for this evening on behalf of the collective Curating for Culture. To know more about me or my work as a designer, please follow me on Instagram. Before we get started, may I please request you all to ensure that your devices are on mute, your WhatsApp tab on the browser is closed, and any electronic devices around you are on silent or no sound mode. These sessions are being recorded and screen will be taken for documentation and dissemination purposes. Hope we have your consent for the same. Uh, so to follow today's order, let's start with the participants introduction. Uh, we will keep to one minute per person and I'll strictly stop you at the end of your time. Please bear with us. So I'm going to call um, your name the chronological order so that I don't miss anyone. Aparna, would you like to take over and yeah, start the sure. introduction? Uh, I am Aparna and uh, I I am a graduate in electronics and I also did my sound recording from FTII in 2010. Uh, I have work experience of working with audio, visual and community archives for three and a half years and in IT for about three and a half, four years. I also did a master's in Pune University where I wrote a dissertation on the critical, uh, I mean, a critical study of archival practices uh, focusing on film and the National Film Archive of India. And currently I'm a Fulbright fellow uh, doing my master's at uh, NYU Tisch uh, in moving image archiving and preservation. So yeah, that's my in short introduction. Um, we'll now move on to Archita. Um... Could you please introduce yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Archita. Uh, I have been teaching at uh, St. Joseph's College in Bangalore for five years now. I teach in the Department of English, and uh, some of our courses have modules on archiving. So I've been enjoying uh, the last few sessions thoroughly, and it's giving me newer ways of looking at designing my module. So thanks to everybody who has been part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Archita. Can I request Darshita? to introduce herself. Hi, uh, my name is Darshita. I'm an art critic and a performance poet based out of Chicago currently. Um, just graduated from a, a course called New Arts Journalism from the School of the Artist of Chicago. And I'm currently working on a manuscript. So hi, everyone. I'm Gayatri. I grad I yes, grad yes, Gayatri. I completed my master's last year in information arts and design from Shristi Institute of Art Design. And technology and then for over a year I've taught I worked with a school in Bangalore to conduct design thinking workshops for uh, across the grades and my master's project was about archiving so that sparked my interest and that got me interested in this um, program or this these sessions and it has been really helpful to look at archiving in different ways and not even this or not only the sessions but the questions and the answers help me look at my projects in a different way so thank you everyone thank you ishita and Vallabhi. thank you gayatri over to kartike hi everyone uh, this is kartike shodan an architect based in ahmedabad a graduate from school of architecture uh, set and uh, having a uh, independent practice in architecture for over 25 years and uh, uh, just gone back to the alma mater, now teaching and uh, involved in research activities. And I'll be soon uh, playing a role at the ARCCEPT archive. Thank you. It's been a pleasure attending this uh, uh, webinar series. And thanks, Ashita, for having me here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just reading out names from here. So, Mithul. Uh, my name is Mithul. I'm an independent uh, photo artist and a curator based in Ahmedabad. Uh, I am currently also working with a gallery, uh, which is a part of Navjeevan Press. And we have started curating a small archive, a fairly new archive of photo works of uh, Indian artists, especially. And uh, other than that, I am currently personally working on a project on mental health based on my personal archives. Thanks, Mithil. Over to Namita. Namita has sent her introduction in the chat. I think, again, she's not able to perhaps unmute herself. She's completed her master's in photography from National Institute of Design. Um, 
Jai. She's currently working as a museum researcher in a design firm in Pune. Yeah, okay, not working. Okay, so you can send me chat messages. I'm happy to read it out. Um, Kuntal, um, I'm an architect from Surat. I've done urban planning from UK. Currently working on affordable housing at Sachiwala Gandhinagar. Niyati, over to you. Hi, I'm Niyati. I'm um, I'm a student at uh, London College of Fashion. Currently doing my masters in fashion curation. Um, I'm learning, I, I was previously uh, into communications and um, hardcore uh, advertising styling, um, but I moved my interest into documentation in uh, textile and crafts um, and getting to learn more about archiving and museology in um, textile and crafts perspectives. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Neyati. Okay, so we'll um, move on to Rukmini. Hi, I'm Rukmini. I'm currently finishing my master's in arts and aesthetics in JNU, Delhi. Um, I just wanted to thank Ishita and Walubi for organizing this. I've had a great time. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, okay, we have uh, Vishwesh. Hi, yeah. uh, I'm Vishwesh. Yeah, I can. Yeah, it just yeah, it took a little while to unmute. Uh, sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Vishwesh. Uh, I've I've worked mainly as an architect and an urban designer for nearly two decades, uh, until 2019, and since then I've been uh, teaching at Srishti in Bangalore. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Venkat, would you sort of introduce um, who's speaking? Yeah. You mean introduce Ishita? Is that what you said? Yes, yes. Um, I Hi. mean, I, can, I would love to have a personal note, but you could also introduce uh, yourself. Hi, I'm Venkat. I'm an archivist at the Archives and the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Venkat. Um, just again, I think just the way we have had different speakers and I really enjoyed telling how I personally know them. Uh, I met Venkat when I moved to Bangalore, like uh, at the oral history conference where Brinda and I also met. Uh, but Brinda was in another city and uh, Venkat was just next door and setting up an archive. So it was quite exciting. Uh, it was quite exciting to sort of see through the whole process um, and and passively be a part of it, but also it was more exciting that he would ex he would want to work with students from art and design practice, um, and uh, I could I could interface on that level with the archives at NCBS, um, and I think that's very important with the kind of conversation uh, one wants to moderate or have today about the role of creative practices in curating archives. So thank you, Venkat, for accepting our invitation. He couldn't, uh, he rather uh, preferred that the uh, team join us to sort of part, uh, gave us the talk on um, 11th. Uh, and he agreed to sort of join us for this conversation today. I think that's wonderful. OK, um, we have missed out a few people or they've joined later. So Riddhi, do you want to try now? Is your mic working? Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, Riddhi, go Good morning, on. Everyone. Uh, yes. I'm Riddhi. I'm Riddhi from Rajkot, Gujra from Gujarat. And uh, I teach in an architecture college in Rajkot. And uh, my, my interest uh, lies in the subjects like history and humanities. So uh, with this interest, I did my master's in theory and design and my MPhil in uh, MPhil with the subject specialization in history and theory. So with that, with that as a background, I uh, like I, I started uh, looking into the library, library and all the uh, archival materials and we have set up an archive in our college. And I uh, and uh, the archives at Indubai Parek School of Architecture focuses on the the architectural heritage of Saurashtra, which is uh, like Rajkot is the center of Saurashtra, and we have a lot of documentation done in this region. So 
so our students have done a lot of documentation in this region and uh, that is how i knew uh, ishita because she was heading the archives at set and uh, that that's how i'm here thank you and thank you everyone yeah ishita over to you um, thank you riddhi uh, we have ishita we have you uh, more people so just one uh, we will we'll just speak with them as well so can can we have um, debankita introduce herself please debankita can you hear us okay mute mic issues okay so by the time debankita writes about herself raj would you want to introduce yourself i am raj maurya i am a student and id gandhinagar uh, studying photography degree so yeah, i am interested in archiving like uh, also my current project is based on archiving which is based on sabarmati archives yeah i wanted to connect with you all people and know like how archiving thing works in the rest of the india thank you for uh, like making a part of this a lot many more practices in india to catch up on um hello i think uh, i can talk now yeah so i am madhu mehra live in bangalore and i i am smriti mehra's mother i i was an msc in physics came to bangalore after i got married and i joined a bank and took premature retirement and to keep myself busy i am now doing uh, knitting accessories i have a pay, facebook page called she who knits and yeah i do people can buy online and i have all exhibitions it's just a passion which i have uh, created the page to keep myself busy in my post retirement life thank you so amazing thank you okay um bhano you can take over i think we are still waiting for everybody to be able to hear each other there's some serious uh, connectivity issues or google server right I, that's why i thought uh, i was also uh, trying to figure that if my password this problem or <laughs> is it like everybody is facing the problem um because the sound that's coming so no since yesterday we have been noticing um, that everybody sort of keeps getting connected disconnected to the to the meeting for some reason yeah oh uh, yeah i was also getting very bad sound but are you able to hear me clear Yes, right now it's okay, good. Yeah, I thought I'll just finish my introduction so that we can uh, see how we are going forward next. I'm Banu. I work with uh, Janastu. Uh, we are just uh, giving a talk here uh, under Ishita's uh, curation on digital archiving. Uh, it's really nice uh, to come together here. Uh, we look forward to see how today will go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Banu. I'm just going to read out uh, Devankita's introduction. She's currently about to finish a master's in ancient history from JNU. Uh, she loves mapping forts of Delhi. She has mapped city fort and some medieval structures of Mandu, Madhya Pradesh. Uh, because of her background in archaeology, and someday she would love to work with ceramics. That sounds very exciting, Devankita. More power to you. Okay, so I think with all these ifs and buts of the connection, we'll move on. Um, which was me trying to sort of take you all through a bit of my practice, uh, but not because it's my practice, but rather to sort of position ourselves into the evening's conversation. i'm going to try and present so yeah i'm calling this uh, uh, on curating archives because that's the most basic title i wanted to work with when we were planning this series and how it has been a personal yet a very collective journey and when i say that as a collective uh, or rather a collaborative practice and i'm still confused between these two words so excuse me for that i don't usually now start my presentations without the credit slide first because i think everything that we see henceforth um, or whatever you keep seeing 
as my practice um, in the future. It's not going to be possible without so many people or practices or teams coming together. And I would not want it other way around ever. So uh, this I'm also borrowing this presentation from a very recent talk I had to deliver. And uh, this was about working with our history theory and preservation. So I wanted to position it around these three def, uh, uh, um, frameworks, which is uh, these three as a framework, which is documented around width. And hence, I wanted to put these very dictionary definitions out there and sort of question them, because they don't remain true uh, once I go further into my practice. I just like this image a lot uh, because it compiles, it sort of comprises of all these three. So Johanna is a researcher. Um, she's come to the archives. I'm sort of taking her through a very important magazine or periodical, which sort of fits into her research. But then she's documenting me talking about it. And there's a dialogue between us. So I didn't feel like I'm under the under the lens. And yes, so it's, it's all three of them coming together and how they are sometimes very inseparable. Um, so the first project for me, uh, as most of you have heard it now four times, <laughs> starts with uh, setting up SEPT Archives, uh, India's first repository on architecture, planning, design-related material. Um, and uh, very basic. It's about setting up an institution. So uh, very important to have what it looks like, right? Sometimes when, when you think that, oh, I'm, it's not about the building, but no, sometimes it is about the building. It's about the presence of a certain institution. And what is the message that you send when you when you uh, reuse a building? I'm not getting into the biography or the profile statement, just the fact which is that the key focus area of archiving the collections was uh, initially to look at post-independence. And then we realized that we do need to go a bit back in time. There were collections coming in from, pre uh, 19th century or pre 20th century as well and uh, keeping your doors open to that. Um, so uh, dialogue over here, I mean, I might not always refer to these three words, but somewhere where I feel the necessity, uh, I suddenly started seeing the whole idea of working with the material as a dialogue um, and not necessarily always with people. Uh, that also was there. So there was the oral history project, but also reading into the material. And sort of this became a prerequisite if one looks at it, because you were setting up an archive in the country where there is no architectural archive. Uh, so you're sort of deriving or setting up your own systems. And hence, the material tells you what's the best way of keeping it. There's no other way. Um, yes, there are other standards which you follow in terms of uh, archival measures and precautions. So just to quickly like, give you a sense, this is um, the team of student assistants working at the Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation office where we had sort of started collaborating towards the second year. And archive, I mean, sort of record keeping these collections. Um, this is us looking at Arvind Talati's collection and putting it into place, the team was much more meticulous than sometimes me. Um, this is Kushu Kalyanwala, the director then, who was in conversation with Sarto Almeida, who recently passed away in Goa, and trying to archive an office, an, a, a huge practice. So that was a much bigger task. You're sitting in Goa for a week, also doing the oral history recording, but sifting the material through. We had Ritu, I forget her full name, who I think Ritu Sonalika, who's an alumni as well of SEPT. And she sort of became the local curator for, to take the things forward. And this is Peter's, Professor Peter Scriver and Amit Srivastava from Adalad, uh, University of Adalad, who had visited us. And they're looking at the, the panels of a pull down exhibition. So even that is equally important, what you do with the reproduced material. And this is just the sense of projects that were going on there. Uh, do understand my information is dated. Uh, a lot more has happened since 2016. And do keep following SEPTA archives on their Facebook page. Um, and then uh, the need to document or documentation. Uh, how do you keep certain kind of material? It's handmade, it's broken it's into pieces, but and it's rolled, so it takes time to straighten it out. You might have the best systems. Um, to material which has come in many more formats. This is again Arvind Talati collection. It's almost like half of their office has now arrived at the archives, and how do you go about organizing it you're parallelly also designing the exhibition and the need for certain record systems and and again why the record sheet becomes important to me is because we set it up from scratch 
um, not to say that there weren't uh, codes and standards we couldn't look at, but yes, they still need to need to be um, adapted to or sort of uh, tailored to um, what an architectural archive would need uh, to adhere to. And then again, listing out your basic procedure, uh, which sort of sort of becomes a bit in house. How does your team work? How does it work within your system of things? Whereas elsewhere, they might do the formal documentation. So the archives visited in Europe and UK, I would imagine that formal documentation happens even before the basic listing happens. But things in India, or at least the, the teams we met with, it was different. We needed to assure them, we needed to work our way into getting the collections and um, taking our time through the documentation. Um, and there was a sense of trust, of course. So even in some cases, oral histories were done beforehand. Um, and then the form of dissemination, which we all know one is to exhibit. Um, and SEPTA archives has a permanent exhibition space uh, to ensure that it's not forgotten that we have to make all of this content available, apart from storing it very well. Um, and three, four exhibitions have happened until now uh, of different kinds, of course, not necessarily. And these exhibitions not necessarily talk only about the architectural content. So um, it was it was about taking the narrative beyond architecture and design, connecting it to the society, connecting it to the politics uh, of a nation or of a, a city or a state. This is very specifically Gemini Mehta's exhibition or even Arvind Talati's exhibition, which set out to do it very well. And also engaging beyond the archive, which has always, I mean, beyond the exhibition, which has been something that at least to few of us was very uh, important that, you know, the collection is much bigger. And what an exhibition or a publication does is deduces it, juices it out. And how do you make the larger collection available? So if there was a team of uh, viewers interested, we would sit them down. We had rented out this computer and we would take them through some interested set of drawings, interesting set of drawings. There was another form of dissemination. Um, so you can go to the website. It's called septarchives.org. It's work in progress, but at least it's a robust search engine which takes you through um, the material, lets you access it, makes it very legible, readable. Uh, you can study it quite clearly. But also what I was thinking when I was thinking, because now I'm away from Septarchives, is this form of dissemination. I know this image might not be very clear, but what it is, is a flowchart of handing over Septarchives. And it was actually, I think, about three A3s, if I remember it correctly, or four A3s that I put together. Um, and and how would you how would you put down the entire process for somebody? How will how will you make this process easy to be taken over? Because even you, if we have noticed the conversations over the week were about how an archive is not about the arch should not become about the archivist. So it's easier said than done. And hence, one wanted to make the system as um, transferable as possible. Apart from uh, so each of these sections is then many more sheets in an in a in a binder file at SEPT archives, which sort of becomes a manual is what I'm referring to. So that's also equally a part of dissemination that archives are transferable. Um, I'm going to skip through this project. Uh, as I said, I was uh, taking this from another presentation. Uh, it's because contesting heritage as an open studio sort of sets the stone for our foundation for the kind of work we did at Kishkinda Trust. Uh, this is an NGO in Hambi, and um, what we collaborated first for was to build a community-driven archive. Um, so Kishkinda Trust has been there for more than 20 years, and they have a lot of rich material uh, from created by themselves or by their teams, but also by researchers who come and collaborate with them. And how do we make this material available to more people, but also something that the community sort of um, believes in, community sort of engages with or sees value in. Um, and this exercise started with Shama Pawar, who sort of is the director of uh, Kishkinda Trust. And then we had um, two interns and then we had two more interns. So we had two rounds of internships and total four interns who worked on this project. Um, and the biggest uh, biggest uh, struggle was to create an information architecture, which works for the kind of work that um, TKT involves itself in. They work with the ideas of culture and cultural heritage and um, 
sustenance of communities if i have to uh, say it on behalf of them and hence when you and uh, also the fact that in hampi uh, the communities sort of were getting ignored initially after um, the world heritage nomination happened for the ruins and the sites so the questions really lie in lie in the uh, in the fact what role does community have to play when it comes to cultural heritage and preservation of cultural heritage um and the kind of work hence they do uh, encompasses so many aspects of life so you have culture and education responsible tourism cottage industries and conservation and maintenance and again outreach as it would be required so when we started putting um these projects under these different categories we suddenly realized how projects also have a life of its own and this black and white categorization which one was used to uh given the background at septa archives was not really falling into place so just to give you an example that um for example peshigarh house now falls into responsible tourism but it once used to be um an office as well so now where does it go or do you duplicate the information um so how do you basically talk about life or integrated or living heritage right uh how do you bring back bring in the voice of the people because the more we would engage with these reports they were like reports they were documentation um um binders if i put it for the lack of better word and people or traditions or practices weren't captured to the degree at which ishkan that trust works with it so what happened to that was we moved from documentation to the act of dialogue so i did this uh, 15 day long workshop which was a part of the curriculum for the program i was uh, facilitating at shishti and i took these eight postgraduate students to hampi and agundi uh, to study or uh, to carry out ethnographic study what they did was four teams um, they divided themselves into four teams uh, and we had identified four indigenous communities the banjaras the agriculturalists the folk performers and the vernacular construction makers and then they spent entire one week just talking to these families we just had perhaps one lead and then the uh, student teams went on and found out more farmers and more uh, construction makers and more um, performers to talk to and they spend more and more time doing audio video recordings with them trying to understand their lives and their stories and through their eyes understand the changing landscapes um of hampi and anegundi and what this exercise was at least targeted towards was mapping narratives uh, so what you see on the left is a more rough cut initial idea and then towards the they are not the same project sorry and then towards the right what you see is a more um more definitive structure though the students always feel that you know 15 days was not enough and i agree with them if we could have spent more time and we are planning to real uh in state this project by our own selves and see if we can take this forward why we did this mapping in a certain way was to make sure that we can create a more interactive um archive and uh, the the communities were interested in having the link onto their mobile phone so that they can show it to people when they come next time so not only it goes into the kishkin that trust archives but it also has a life uh, a more floating or a more fluid life in between what we needed was also uh, tools like film making or post production that's used in film making where you go around mapping your videos and audios against uh the sub themes and the uh, metadata that you were creating and that led to a wordpress um this was a very makeshift solution and as i said uh, we never made it public because while the narratives the way they have come out are very interesting we have not been able to interlink uh, narratives with the audio recordings with the video recordings with the photographs and the kind of play that we wanted um and we hopefully will reinstate this uh, project soon and this this brings me to um, what is going on since last 9 uh, months now uh, biome environmental solutions private limited is um it would be very wrong to call them only an architectural firm but yeah they are an architectural firm but who they are focused on ecological consciousness or ecological approach and uh, they are a lot more than architects they are urban planners they have um and engineers they have people passionate about water conservation and they work with engineers policy makers and so on and so forth so what i'm doing with them is to archive their practice uh, but also publish uh, about them and uh, what we sort of connected on was 
the idea that this book doesn't need to read only about biome and its projects. It doesn't need to be another catalog, at least for the first uh, publication. What these diaries will do is sort of bring out the voices of people, bring out the stories that make the architecture the way it is, or connect the architecture with the land, and so on and so forth. So very straightforward process. You go around documenting uh, from photo shoot to um, looking at the shortlisted projects, categorizing them, looking at them through chronology, but also the rigorous process of now creating an information architecture which works for the office. Because this is an office in practice, it's just three decades old in that sense, but they have a volume of work uh, and they have a lot more to look forward to. So could a system be developed which also works for future? And of course, in that you try and map how their projects have grown. So parallelly, uh, simultaneously, as I was saying, the interest was to speak and talk and dialogue and find out uh, about the emotions associated, about the experiences. So you went on and spoke to out of 90 shortlisted projects, we spoke to 30 clients. Uh, and beyond that, we spoke to architects, contractors. We still are yet to speak to the mason and uh, electrician. Uh, the conversation is happening on Tuesday. So how many more perspectives could we build? And beyond this, uh, we are also now in the publication. We are working with the idea that how many more people could write about bio. So the whole idea is to make an archive, even an archive at an institutional office level, make it about a community, make it about multiple voices and not just about um, the five people or eight people who are working on it. Yes, there will be an interface, there will be a digital archive the way we saw for SEPT archives uh, or many other archives that you know of, where you could scheme through the material um, without any bias or without any um, authorship per se. But the outcomes of this process is also to make more, more make space for more voices. Again, this is sorry, not immediately relevant. And then finally, what I wanted to show or what has uh, what all of this has led to is this one uh, Instagram post where I said, "What will you all do in lockdown? Let's archive family histories." And this led to three rounds of online workshop. 10 days, 15 days, 10 days, something like that. Uh, I kept playing with the content myself as well uh, without any compromises for the participants. And quite a few of them are here in the audience today. Um, so the idea was to navigate into a space or creating archive, archival projects through a project experience. What would it be if I own up to the archive, I am curating it, and uh, Ishita, who's facilitating it, is only supposedly just scaffolding the process into it. So you listen to your material and decide what needs to be done with it. Um, I'm not, again, going through the whole um, idea of the curriculum. And honestly, I'm still working on it. And my questions about today's evening are also about that. But what came out was very interesting. So there were many more ways that people looked at it. I mean, participants looked at it. Somebody was very clear from initial stages what, what the project should start doing in terms of mapping, whereas there were projects like these, Ashmi is in the audience, where she arrives at this. So she's already been working on this project, but she doesn't start the project with a preconceived notion and then she allows herself to flow through whereas aparna who's an artist wants to use the archival story i mean the archived stories to actually build a um, artistic project and could there be a space to allow for all of those and yes of course and then wallabi uh, chose to start it, to start recreating archives right so she's listening to her grandmother images are not there but objects are perhaps around and what would it mean to sort of redraw it or recreate them um, and the most usual which you would find is old photographs old maps drawings objects of the house that started coming out and emotions associated with it um, Niyati again uh, sort of takes it to another level of dialogue where she starts doodling or sketching once she speaks with her mother about her mother, that is Niyati's grandmother. So it's another layer of creating archives. Uh, again, Wallabi is redrawing what, uh, how her grandmother describes the old house to be. Um, and of course, the question of how how close these visualizations need to be is something that we all left it open ended. And then I just have this video clip, but again, I'm going to skip this. Um, it's uh, Wallabi also tried video um, 
documentation and it's the comfort at which you know you can see the grandmother narrating her stories and the effort it takes uh, for somebody who's doing personal archiving um in terms of probing and getting the stories out so that's from my end um okay oh so i mean thank you all for listening to me i don't know how long did i really take but i hope it was not that long or uh, boring and um i hand it over to wallabi if you are here thank you sita for that uh, now i would like uh, the speakers to briefly respond to the cur curatorial note let's start with anuradha so first of all uh, it's very very nice to see you all nice to um hear about everyone's backgrounds and thank you to ishita and wallabi for organizing this discussion it's been I I haven't been able to attend all the discussions um uh I have two small children um and so I'm uh unable to attend everything I want to during the week but the beginnings of this um conversation mean a great deal to me I've been studying these subjects for some 20 years or so one of the things that has really struck me in everyone's um in the work that everyone seems to be doing in this group and also in the uh proposals put on the table uh by um the curatorial group who has put this conversation together is indeed this question this difference between archiving and curation and what we can gain from thinking rigorously about that difference i have maintained in my my own um uh study of archives grew out of um uh doctoral dissertation on refugee camps in um east africa and looking at the ways in which refugees very particularly are um denied access to their own history and i think that um my interest in that has been largely about um how archives are created who has access to them and who doesn't and what communities they represent so i hear you talking about these subjects on several different scales the scale of the state the scale of something like an architectural practice or a a practice that exists in the world you know through commerce um so at a different level from the state but connected to it and then perhaps at a very local level a community level and then the very personal level of the family um these are all um i think ways to comprehend um communities and forms of entering community and the way that i've come to really understand archives is that they in some um particular way uh capture the experiences uh of a community another word for that would be history or they capture the heritage of a community and another way to understand heritage is is simply wealth um these the community in question could be an existing community um a well defined community or it could be an imagined community so when we think of the archive of the nation state the nation is in fact an imagined construct so in either case the archive is uh something that is structured and i have a particular interest in architecture and built environments and the way that the built environment as um ishita was pointing out um in the housing of the the new sept archive somehow the building matters um but i think that curating has a very different task its task is also about the community but it's a much more provocative task it's intended to um it's intended to kind of poke at that community and ask a question ask it a question or somehow lay it open for criticism um so in that sense whereas archiving um is intended to directly capture a community curating is intended to reflectively capture that community and um i would just end by saying that i think both strategies 
involve a kind of interpretive gesture, interpretation on the part of the person who creates either the archive or the curatorial project, but also a kind of creative interpretive practice on the part of the, the audience, the person receiving the information. Thank you, Anuradha. Um, over to uh, Vrinda. Uh, first of all, um, thank you, Ishita and Wallabi, for organizing this wonderful event. Um, and um, so I actually missed introducing myself. So I'm Vrinda, and I'm heading Godrej Archives, which I was instrumental in setting it up in 2006. So 14, for 14 years, I have been engaged with uh, chronicling the history of 123 years uh, old Godrej group of companies. Um, so I, I'm really glad uh, I could attend actually few and uh, I'm glad to actually uh, soon follow Anuradha's uh, take when, you know, um, because she has actually, you know, I, I, I attended her uh, presentation and it was really lovely to see uh, archives as an architectural practice, which was quite an interesting uh, thing. And she also mentioned today that, you know, uh, archives as a structure. And um, I would just, oh, yeah. Wait, I'll just uh, to share my presentation. Uh, can everyone see this? Yeah, OK. Um, so this is actually basically a very familiar object whenever we talk about the archives. And that's what actually I would like to talk about, that how we had perceived archives as and how the things are changing now and how uh, you know differently we are engaging with the archives. So this is a, you know, this box will always pop up whenever, you know, uh, in your mind, uh, even in minds of researcher or an archivist, uh, because this is a very familiar object that you know symbolizes, uh, and this is how we had perceived the archive still today. And uh, so this symbolizes not an open world, you know, to begin with. So it is always an enclosure, and it defines the boundaries. It uh, divides the interior world and the exterior world, and there is you know uh, this comfortable uh, feeling for the contents that are inside it because there is no confrontation to the external world. And that's how I think archives were always perceived as to have control over the content and there are like boundaries and, uh, you know, archivists were really very um, comfortable in their repository kind of a space. Uh, but now I think we cannot really uh, restrict ourselves to this box. And uh, so because we want to, if we want to bring about the authentic story as, uh, as authentic as possible, then we need to make it more democratic, make it more open, where we can actually include multiple subjectivities. And you know, often it is we often discuss the uh, you know this idea of objectivity. And I would actually rather say that subjectivities are very important because then every object becomes really unique because it is it has come from their own personal experiences. And that's why I think it's uh, you know we need actually a lot of contradictory sources also in the archives to weigh against uh, each other and to be contextually accurate, if I may say so. And therefore, what we need today is breaking these exterior walls. And now I would like to um, take you to my next slide, because this box wasn't just the box in the archives. Uh, but I happened to see this box as an art installation uh, at the 56th Venice Biennale, if I'm correct. Uh, and uh, where it was presented as an art installation by this uh, Cuban artist, Ricardo Bray. And uh, he actually uh, had displayed these 14 cube shaped artworks uh, as a part of his initial exhibition called Inside Out. And this uh, title itself says that how these are to be experienced. That is, uh, they are not to be simply open, but they have to be uh, they have to be unfolded, uh, fold by fold, petal by petal is what he says. And uh, this artist actually, um, you know, makes it really demanding uh, on the viewer's participation because the viewers have to be there when he's opening each and every box. And this is what actually they look like. So every uh, every box had these real little uh, curio items, a lot of documents, a lot of pieces from history, a lot of memories. And this whole uh, process of unraveling, unfolding, uh, made it really amazing to see that uh, as an art installation because then viewers were like participating it as a, uh, so this kind of a, uh, I think participatory and you know inclusive kind of a view uh, was something that really startled me. And that's when I thought that, you know, this is exactly the transformation that I would like to see in the archives from the box to 
you know opening these exterior walls and making viewers also participate making communities participate in that archives and you know have you know start that dialogue that you know ishita spoke about and um, this is i think uh, you know what we need today and there is a very wonderful article and i would like to conclude with that because uh, there is randall Jim, uh, jimerson who in his essay which was published in 2005 which titled embracing the power of archives and uh, he has brought out a very wonderful analogy uh, of uh, changing role of archives from being temples of power to a restaurant that allows mediation and interpretation so this i think continuous dialogue is what actually i think uh, you know is a path ahead and that's where i think i feel uh, but then you still need this box because you know unless and until you have the uh, you know proper documentation control over this content you cannot really uh, curate this content and in a more engaging way because you know this is as uh, ricardo had said you know the box is our head the box is the key it is the attic and it is heart and it is the memory so how you are going to engage with the memory is i think where the curation part uh, comes in and that's what i would actually like to refer like unboxing the past is for me the curation part of it so i think that's what i would like to um, end that thank you brinda that was really beautiful uh, over to bagu and team chanastu hi guys um, it was a very interesting uh, conversation ishita i liked the presentation it was anything but boring and uh, also looking at uh, your work uh, with kishkinda trust i think uh, that reminded me of uh, my first projects at janastu uh, which i was interning uh, for as a as a associate uh, to help with uh, you know translating uh, material so that was wholly about the intangible heritage of hampi and the uh, dasara uh, vijayadashmi traditions of hampi and how that has shaped today's state patronage to this festivals and what goes beyond that and uh, professor chalu raju working in kannada university hampi with his background uh, coming from tribal studies and uh, you know is uh, work being published in kannada uh, publications and uh, but not to the uh, larger uh, like archiving or any of those sorts so uh, my first project was involving in such place and uh, and i was uh, you know uh, we were still grappling uh, as i said in my talk that we are not archivists we are a technology group we give technical assistance support and all of that uh, and chalu raju comes being the subject matter expert in in communities tribals and his studies of intangible heritage around hampi and all of that uh, but still this this western idea of i don't know if i'm using this word rightly so don't uh, kill me for that i was just meaning to say that the idea of archiving the metadata the standards the vocabulary this whole process or processes uh, i don't think has flown uh, down uh, to the ground or to the field like amazing researchers their work and everything being published in local languages and all of that but they are not accessible in the sense they are accessible to the people who are interested in that uh, local areas and and who know kannada like pro, like if i have to say professor chelu raju would be accessible to those people or who, who are students in kannada university and those people who are interested to pick up a kannada book to read but the kind of research that's gone into uh, we feel it's a it's a i don't know but it's a shame that uh, you know uh, we have not still yet figured what is our indian context uh, and that's i mean in plural uh, you know uh, and that's so various and the breadth is so wide that we uh, won't be uh, able to i think like you know this is the conversation that's been even around even in the milli sessions and everything how how do we become inclusive and uh, provide space to communities the people who are who are actually like you know how do we define co creation in the sense that all these people get ownership to what what their stories are um and i think uh, our idea in this we call this renaration web and uh, like say for example when i started i i meant to say that that all this archiving technicalities as much 
as it is important it cannot be uh, uh, you know uh, it it it's so hard for a normal person to grasp and hence like you know but still naturally you know what we come across stories and every time we come across stories we share it around with others definitely when we share back the stories that we uh, got from somewhere else we are interpreting it we are narrating it in our own way to our own people and this is the most natural thing i think as humans that we do that is how we have preserved our uh, stories and heritage uh, uh, or like you know personally and family ways all of those really important things not getting into the state and narratives but if you have to go into the state and institutions and the subjects one example that i would like to give is uh, the work that we were doing with uh, with uh, law law uh, law uh, organizations activists uh, alternative law forum and their problem is that there is uh, say for example there is street vendors law there is the uh, minimum wages act there is all these laws and acts whom does it concern can one a tailor electrician plumber mason can he today find out what is his minimum wage what is the government like you know all these things that is there and the target audience whom it is concerned of there is a huge gap and that's where we uh, we feel that there is a need for a community's uh, engagement to narrate and re-narrate stories for different audience and uh, and that's why i think uh, uh, that's how i think i i'll go back to the point that i was saying that uh, ishita's uh, presentation uh, brought me back to my first internship about the humpy project i'll drop the link in the chat so since i wouldn't understand much about archiving and everything but still i understood what it is about narrating a story and we started with say documenting it bringing up a documentation but narrativizing it and after narrativizing the document like we have a recording we record a story from professor chalu raju then we start narrating it and then make the translations then we have to add the visuals and then you have layered story there is the oral history or there is the oral story and then there is the textual version and then there is the audio visual version so stories have these versions and and these versions are nothing but those interpretations that i was um, talking about i think I, I have not any point to make but i do um, i mean there is a lot of questions i mean all these things you know all these practices that is natural how can those things how can we take advantage of those things that's natural to us thanks thanks for uh, uh, giving me the space here to voice it out and uh, thank you ishita wallabi it's been great and, and and all the panelists and everyone thank you banu uh, over to venkat thanks wallabi and um, thanks ishita for having us uh, this has been really nice this whole week um, uh, I apologize for not doing the video. I'm just on very low bandwidth, so I'm just trying to get this out before it. Uh, you know. So uh, there are a couple of things that I heard from all of you that sort of really resonated with me, and I appreciate the the, the tone that it. Uh, when Brunda shared this conversation around the box, you know, in a sense, you know, both as a metaphor and in the literal sense, I thought that was very apt for thinking about the archive. And towards the end. Um, I, I don't know, Runda, if you said it, if that's what the person said about the box being our heart. And um, I think about words a lot personally, and uh, or etymology of words in the English language. And uh, the the word record, as many of you would know, is, is is a form of you know committing to the heart. You know, coming from record, cordis. And so there is this idea of uh, something that is being sentimental in some ways about about the archive in, in some in some aspects of the archive so there is this aspect i mean something to think about the relationship between memory and record um, and to to realize that to to record is to commit to the heart um i i love what anu had said the other day about the archives being a political act and also um, the architecture as a form of knowledge which you know told me to sort of think a little bit about the framing of, of the archive itself about you know what is the sourcing and the scope of, of an archive, um, it's it's so often um, uh, it's very common, I guess, for us now to use the word our word archive in a variety of different tones. Perhaps most commonly in 
in the sense of thinking about our email records, and which is perfectly legitimate. Um, however, it's I started to dig into these histories again. It was fun to realize that the word archive as a verb, you know, the act of archiving came much later than the form of the archive. You know, when I say much later, I mean a span of 250 years, roughly, before we went from the form, the built form of the archive, to a point when we started to use it as, as an action. And uh, that kind of a time frame is useful for us to think about when we start thinking about what, is, what does it mean to archive anymore. And I think this ties to, for me personally, Ishita's question of you know, archives versus curation. And so uh, in my mind, or in my personal opinion, there's a certain circularity um, that starts from memory. Um, the memory giving rise to uh, a set of curated objects, the curated objects leading to a possibility of an archive, the archive leading to the possibility of interpretation, the interpretation leading to the possibility of narration and re-narration, as Bhanu had uh, so lovely, uh, wonderfully pointed out, and the re-narrations giving rise to other forms of memories. And uh, this this circularity for me is sort of very crucial, which because it it, it allows a very forgiving scope and not being um, boxed, to use Brunda's uh, metaphor, of thinking about what is the difference between the curator and the archivist. It, it is simply to say that at any given moment, you could be one of these, and you could swap roles as and when you go around these spaces. And there's a, there's a way in which we, we can encompass all these roles as, as, as a memorialist, as a recorder, as an archivist, as a curator, as a narrator, as a re-narrator, re re and as an artist who does this. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of the framework, and I think it's especially useful when, you know, I think one of the questions that you had raised, Ishita, in your, in your note was about archiving in the present or archiving in the contemporary, um, about what, what does it mean if we don't give it the benefit of time? Um, what, what do we know from the present as, you know, as what do we deem to be important? I think that also has a certain very forgiving approach to it that, the, the archive is not there to decide that for you. In a sense, it's almost very tautological that it, it will happen in the decisions that you take. Because what is the archive if not a space to capture decisions, context, and process? Um, and that uh, I, I will probably just leave it with that sort of framework. Um, and I uh, would love to sort of hear other, other people's thoughts as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Venkat. Uh, I, I'm just pitching in because uh, I mean, I, I mean, I would like to tie this conversation further ahead. But just clarifying that I didn't pose that question. It's actually coming from Aparna. I think I feel that I have some clarity as to how I've moved from uh, being an archivist to being a curator of archives. And that's what my presentation of my work is trying to sort of explore. And I think Anuradha addressed it a bit by saying that, yes, when you start working with communities, when you work with a group of people, when I am not working with material, anymore i am i am not the archivist is how i see it and and i am sort of the facilitator or the catalyst rather not even facilitator rather the catalyst for communities coming together behaving a certain way telling me about the material or telling us whoever is working with them about the material and hence we become the curator uh, and this is something is up for debate and discussion but just wanted to clarify that the question actually came from aparna on the instagram uh, post sorry, sorry. Um, I, and, yeah. about, I think i might have no, it's okay. can i just add one more because i just triggered one yes. more thing because i i was so moved by uh, seeing smriti's work a couple of days ago um, on the website, and I was looking through it, and uh, this is perhaps familiar to most people in this audience. Uh, the when I saw it, it reminded me immediately also of another documentary by Sarah Poli, which is titled "Stories We Tell." Um, and in that documentary, um, Sarah Poli sort of, I think, voices it out for her uncle or father, I forget who it was, where they say that when you're in the middle of a story, it isn't like a story at all. It's only when you're telling it to someone else that that it starts to resemble something like a story. Um, and it, it's, it sort of very strongly resonated that idea for me personally. Um, and I'll just maybe leave with one last curiosity to this audience because, you know, we're talking about the archives in the Indian context. And when I look at the way the word archive is described or captured in many South Asian languages, um, in a way, I feel like the, the flexibility that English has offered to the word archive has not quite happened for a variety of the same, you know, the, the, the counterpart word in most South Asian languages, you know, uh, you know, a space for letters in Hindi, 
you know, it's very definitive in what it's trying to do. And it's very difficult to verbalize it in the way that we have taken those 200 years of time to start to make archive an action uh, from the from the noun to the to the way of doing it. Avanagapagam in Tamil, which is, you know, a space for letters. If I remember, I mean, people who speak Tamil here, please can please correct me. Muhafiz um, Khan in Urdu, you know, a space for precious documents. There is still a certain form approach to the word archive. So I'd be very curious to know how people think about this, especially Bhanu, I'd love to think about, you know, when we think of the re-narration of the archive itself, how do we start to think about that a little bit? So, sorry, just didn't want to take more time, but sparked that thought. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Venkat. Uh, over to Smriti. Hi, uh, I'm Smriti and um, one of the presenters in this series. I'm an artist. Some very interesting insights from everybody. And I think that what I've, you know, Ishita, from seeing your presentation, I think you make a strong case for archivist as artist, that your role <laughs> doesn't have to be sort of limited to the rigor yeah. of that one sort of, uh, you know, one discipline of doing something. But um, that as an archivist, I think um, you probably know the archive way better. So it, you already have the, the, the a more in-depth sort of uh, understanding and knowledge of what you're doing. And what better space uh, from there to give yourself the freedom to sort of be able to narrate and be able to tell stories and to interpret and um, and and to use the freedoms of an artist to sort of express um, perhaps something that comes from a different space in terms of motivation uh, and intent. Um, I also think that there are just so many um, I, I ask, I'm, I'm confronted with this as well uh, as an artist who works with nonfiction. Um, we have, uh, I can see that we share a lot of um, processes, um, ethnographic research, our methodologies and, the, and, and what we use to actually uh, do what we do. Um, I, I think uh, there's always this problem of trying to define yourself as a particular um, it, it, of defining yourself into um, uh, defining your practice. Uh, and I think that we we have a lot of freedoms today to be able to define ourselves uh, as more just more than just one thing. A lot of times I uh, am. Um, asked how um, my work that sits at the cusp of art, but it's also not fully there. It's like I have a leg in there with the storytelling and the craft, uh, but the work is so embedded more in, um, in, in, a, in a sort of research uh, met, met methodology and sort of more looking at um, visual anthropology and I and I think that that's really interesting um, I would love to see uh, you call yourself uh, an archivist and an artist <laughs> yes I, I cannot deny that I mean um, I don't think I, I, I also now want to resort to any of one of these writers as you rightly said uh, and it comes from the space of questioning um, because you say archivist, do I have to follow the structured system that has been set in, you know, and, and the standards and the, because then there is a lot of academic discourse that one very unknowingly starts getting into because these codes were not defined for the Indian context. These codes don't work when I, I go down to towns like Mubidri, Bidar, Gulbarga. They wouldn't even work for biomes practice, to be very honest. Forget going to another town. Um, and also to uh, sort of, uh, sort of, reiterate i think or where i feel uh, i sort of i could reconnect with the thought where the way um, venkat put it that at least there is a forgiving space there is a space to try and explore and work with it as raw material uh, uh, full of creative possibility with it and then it's just about moving it from one locked space to another locked space rather than making it open making it accessible so yeah, I don't mind calling myself artist. I call myself curator or 
uh, historian. And and these roles keep changing the way uh, one deals with the material. And and that's why I think that the power is then in the material and not with me, uh, in the material or in the community or the collective that's working with it so uh with that um now we can move on to a more open moderated conversation and um i just want to because we just spoke about these different roles and this whole idea of not of being boxed uh, i want to quickly go to the one of the questions which i have highlighted um, so yeah there have been a few discussions over this week about the need for teaching uh, or training programs in archiving and uh, I was wondering if any of the panelists have further comments on it, especially in context to the Indian systems, whether it's social, political, uh, or cultural systems, or economic uh, well-being of uh, institutions and communities. And and how do you deal with the overbearing requirements and opportunities? The moment you say you're teaching or training something, it comes with this logic of where will I find work? And uh, so, how would you respond to? The question about curriculum or content for archival training in in the Indian context, or South Asian context. Anyone wants to take it on? Uh, should I start, Ishita? Yes, please, Rinda. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, this is uh, real a pertinent question that we face every day because at the archives, when we need uh, a properly trained people, it's it's very difficult to get. And as I mentioned in my presentation earlier, you know, it's it's a very rare species uh, in India. Uh, so there is only like National Archives, which has, uh, you know, the one year diploma courses and the training available. Uh, so that really becomes a, a problem for us. So what we are doing is we are just taking anyone who is interested in the history. They may be from different backgrounds, like say literature, economics or or history, uh, but they should just love sitting with the documents and they can, uh, you know, love reading through them, interpreting them and they can spend their uh time with it so whoever is patient enough and interested enough we are just taking them and then we train them on the job uh because as you also said that you know because uh, we also have been setting it up we followed our own structures we followed our own systems so i think that that is uh, a really crucial thing that i think in india we should now uh you know start actually exploring that how actually the training can be made available uh, to the larger people and basically introducing this to the history students because museology and archaeology are the you know like popular choices for any history student but archival science never features into it uh, though at the graduation level at the university of mumbai archival science is introduced uh, at a very uh, basic level but still it uh, it really uh, haven't got its due and i think uh, with you know setting up of the archives all across india i think we will need more and more trained uh, people so I, I think you know it's it's time that a lot of institutions start thinking about this as we are like setting it up and as you know that you know not everyone is an archivist who is setting up the archives right now yeah thanks rinda uh, can i extend this question to you venkat because you have worked with uh, very different kinds of students and graduates um, and while I've been in Brinda's shoes, I've understood this need for them to know the systems. And now on the other side where I sort of value that if they don't know, um, there is a range of explorations possible. I think you could speak uh, more clearly about it, I think more out of experience. Um, I can give it a shot. We've had, uh, I mean, I think I completely agree with Brinda, firstly. Um, there's, it's, it's, it's actually almost, um, inexcusable that you know for a country of this size and the diversity and these many archives that we actually don't have any uh, formal spaces or not enough formal spaces to think as i mentioned this comment about the politics poetics and the science like more importantly that the science of the archive um, and if at all it is done i find that it's done in a way that is is a how-to archive um, not the questions of what is an archive why an archive uh, who is the archive? I think those those are more important questions to probe in uh, in a in a sort of an educational space. Um, we've lucked out quite a bit, and Ishita, thanks to you, we've we've also had students who come in from from a world that we would not have expected to probe the archive uh, from the from the world of the arts and the designs. Uh, and uh, that actually what is actually what sort of is prompting my, my comment here to say that we can. If the landscape is quite open, if we really push in that direction, uh, and the 
I mean, and the, the interactions that we've seen of, say, um, a graphic design student interacting with a physics student and both of them working on a project around an archive in the biological sciences is, is an extraordinary interaction. And um, there's, there's so much that can be done in that, in that process. Honestly, we've been doing it so far because nobody has stopped us. Um, uh, at some point, someone will probably question and ask, you know, where is where is the rigor and well, what is your methodology? At that point, we'll probably just have to, you know, duck and start something new somewhere else. <laughs> or you could say that over these experiences, you would have arrived at a, or a framework to show that there was a rigor. <laughs> I would hope so. Then anything else that uh, Smithy or Anuradha would like to add before I move to another question? Manu, you want to add something? Yeah, about the about the teaching and the education part. Yes, please. Um, it's just a personal. Um, I mean, everything I say is personal. Okay, I'm I'm not published anything to be able to quote something. But still, I feel like uh, bringing that up again and again. Uh, so I am a developer. I have been programming and uh, whatever since the last five six years. But that's the last five six years, and I learned uh, all of these things myself. And that was possible to do because those resources were accessible for anybody who has access to Google, say like that. I mean, there is a stack overflow for uh, stuff, like, you know, you ask questions and this and that. And it was so like, you know, it was that simple. Any problem, anything I'm stuck on, it should be a few Google searches away. If not a few Google searches, a few days later, Google searches away but a solution would, would would come across and and then we amongst us developers also have this thing like how smithy just said archivist is a, is an artist <laughs> among the programmers they're like yeah coding is art bro whoever said that it is math i don't know what is that guy up to <laughs> you know <laughs> so, yes yes so i don't know See, I think we can make the learning and resources and everything, but how can we get anybody who's not even linked to that be able to, like, you know, feel at home with these learnings? Like, I think that's a very larger question. I think I post on this is on the entire education system we have set up, but I think that should be also uh, in our uh, view when we are trying to think of, uh, you know, providing uh, or facilitating learning. Uh, then can we come about with, uh, you know, uh, creative ways to allow for a larger uh, set of people whom we have not, whom we might have not even imagined or counted in our uh, list. You know, right. If I add a point, um, just even jumping off of Banu's last point, very nice point actually. Hearing everyone also made me very much miss being able to hear you all in your talks, and I appreciate the things you've brought up, I just wanted to reflect a little bit on, um, you know, our archives and their legacies in India and in broader South Asia, the, the box that Brinda showed us reminded me so much of the sort of the very positivist technical approach to an archive. The archive, you know, was ultimately a colonial instrument for and it involved a kind of a disciplinary background and also a really a kind of professional technical background in um, learning how to preserve objects because the objects themselves would be would become part of the imperial wealth. And I think that um, as we think about archives, archival construction, curation of archives, I think that that question of motive and ethics behind the really the technical knowledge that is required to preserve objects must always be at the forefront. You know, the little box that you showed this archive, this, uh, you know, very iconic archival box that, you know, keeps papers at a certain temperature. It has a certain chemical composition so that when it interacts with papers, it it doesn't alter them. I mean, these are things that I think evolve over a long time, over many sorts of design inputs. Um, and ultimately, by the time you have this object that you see, we've come very far from the motive and ethics 
that began that process. I uh, really, the thing that uh, Venkat raised about this business of archive as a verb and this long trajectory that we've come from the moment when and you know an archive was a noun it was a and it often referred directly in all these languages to something about letters those letters are the sort of human uh, core of this long technical process that i think gets lost in the bureaucracy and the the technical proficiency involved in in that process and I think keeping that, um, when we keep that human core, that like the idea of the letter, the letter from a mother to a daughter, a grandmother to a granddaughter, those are the things, and I really got this from, I, Smriti, I had a chance to look through your website, but I unfortunately couldn't hear your talk. But I mean, I think when we start to think about that, like that as being the core of an archive, and that's really an anti-colonial core. Then um, uh, what I do think happens is something that's quite the opposite to these technical processes. And that is this, um, a different kind of motive in which um, we don't actually work to preserve. We might in fact let things die or get lost or get destroyed or get eaten by ants or whatever it is. Um, I've been working a lot in Sri Lanka, and one of the um, places in Sri Lanka that I find very uh, fascinating, if you all don't know it, is, is the Sapumal Foundation. Um, the Sapumal Foundation was started by Lionel Went. Lionel Went is one of the artists in the 43 group. And he donated all of his, the 43 group was, you know, they founded in 1943, the first kind of progressive artist group in Sri Lanka, but he, they did many paintings and sculptures and um, a really radical group. He donated all these paintings um, to his brother, Harry Pieris, um, who was also called Sapumal. And anyway, the foundation is in their family house and the paintings are all hung in the house. And it's, it's a scandal because, you know, the house is fully open air. There's not a kind of temperature control or these paintings are let, you know, the insects come every, all of these, like, and these are like, um, it's a collection of, a really important collection of modern artworks from a part of the world that has really been war torn, that has very few archives that really can be thought of as intact in this way. And um, it's a radical thing to continue to house them in this way that to my mind is really anti-colonial. It is not, it's not using those technical processes and it's not honoring those uh, preservation processes that really were put in place to shore up colonial wealth. It is doing something else. It is really allowing these things to breathe in their own space. It's allowing them to live, these objects to live their own lives in a, in as liberated a way as possible. I know I'm using a lot of metaphors, but I think you get the, the point. This thing I find really, um, this uh, tension I think is really, really important I do think it comes back to this point that Venkat has raised, which really is about the specificity of of an archive and the and honestly it's it when you have that whether it's through language or whatever creates the specificity, I think that then you start to see a set of motives that can really get to a kind of ethics. And I really would advocate for holding that in place because you know as we develop things like a technical process or a, a licensing process for an archivist in a country I mean these are these are instruments that that bring us very far from those kinds of motives that's uh, really great Anuradha I think I just wanted to touch upon saying like how you brought in the processes of archiving and everything that's uh, that is the colonial past that we have lived 
and i think that's uh, my my uh, view towards the education also is the same like you know it, it just vibrates the same to me thank you uh, thank you anuradha bhanu because uh, and thank you bhanu for tying that up for me uh, once you finished what i really wanted to comment on was or rather uh, reposition my question which was to ask that given we don't have curriculum in archiving could we look at uh, a subversion from the colonial way of education which we are already feeling trapped about in other parts of life um we are doing it with art we're doing it with design let's say um uh, of course there are contestations there as well so could archiving be a space which is taught and studied to be made more inclusive as you were saying so that it's not not uh, only somebody who's certified is allowed to be an art i mean yes there could be certification but is there even a need for it but can these processes and methods be made available and uh, some of the things i mean in directly i was touching upon through my presentation was the fact that community members at whatever stage when they get involved they are picking up these processes um and uh, or smriti's work where she herself uh, and that's a good reference i think on both sides whether you work as an author or an artist yourself or whether you're working as for now I'll call myself a curator and you're working with other team members you are not only looking for a um, certified archivist but somebody as brinda said is passionate about history wants to interpret it has the capability rather than a certain certification or a skill set for it and um, then what would archiving in the country be like sounds very fascinating to me <laughs> um and from there i think i would want wallabi to pose her question because i think it's a it's a good diversion okay, is on that side this time so wallabi is only asking archiving or collecting what is a more appropriate term um in terms of dealing with personal items and i think she's referring to personal histories so she is getting down to the basics of the word itself um when does it become archiving and when does it remain collecting smriti we could start with you because you've worked with personal history yourself and i think it's it's hard to i mean archive has a very very i mean as a, as a process is is very disciplined uh and i think that if you are working with a personal uh collection of things um it, it it just really depends on the process uh i don't know if you can call it um yeah i i'm 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 not sure i can answer that question as an artist i take liberties you know <laughs> uh and i think um how do you look at that is it an archive it is an archive of thoughts it's what you can collect from what is perhaps even left over and i think that is that's the space that i work with is the stony gaps you work with memory and you work with stories and um, you know uh, fictions and fact and it's hard to even separate that so uh, can you call it an archive not necessarily because not everything is fact not everything is uh, um uh, even, not everything can be evidenced uh, you know in that way so is, is it a collection um, it, it is a collection but i think more than that it's um I don't know what terminology to use and with flummox it'll take a bit of time to sort of think about the semantics of uh, you know what what that becomes uh, but i think collections would be more uh, politically correct uh, in terms of uh, you know what what that is vrinda how would you answer uh, this sure. question <laughs> yeah so actually um collection would be the starting point for archiving uh, that's what i would say because you start collecting things but in archiving what is uh, important is also making sense of the collection uh, you know organizing it you know it's, it's again the technical knowledge that we just spoke about uh, and why it is needed is because if you need to disseminate the information that is lying in that contained i think uh, you know collection needs to be like sorted and organized in a particular way uh, again you know like uh, 
uh, as anuradha has said it is then becomes a political act because then you will be uh, you know annotating it uh, in the capacity uh, you know in you know in your own personal capacity and then uh, uh, you know archivist then has a tremendous power over that content but but yes it will start with the collection but unless and until it is described annotated and it is ready uh, to be accessed i think that's when it becomes an archive so unless and until it is accessible with the proper annotation i think <laughs> it will still remain as a collection um so i think yeah that's that's what i would like to see if i need to like put it in like shortly thank you vrinda um venkat banu do you guys want to add anything to that point i mean that question not me i think vrinda said it perfectly so thank you okay i only right. have one small thing to add mm -hmm. in the sense when you see traditionally the archives objects artifacts then you have this thing right like okay your collector and archive all that but when it comes to digital paradigm right now it's not like uh, the same thing as a physical object so where i'm pointing at is like um, your archive might be uh just links to your artifacts wherever they are and all that so but in that sense will my bookmarks in my browser be an archive or a collection like i think the digital uh paradigm poses a little bit of a new uh, for us mm. to challenge our own old views and come up with a, a new way of defining this thing because of the changing world ever changing world so i think that's my um, perspective This is wonderful, Bhano. I think uh, the whole logic of getting you all on board, a team, Janas, to was to continuously keep shifting us between the physical archive and the digital, and how whatever we know on one side of the spectrum doesn't sort of work for the other, and you know, opening up our uh, minds around it. And when you put it uh, in a way about digital um, uh, retrieval or digital uh, projection of an archive, I think. Karthikeya's questions, uh, which are very pragmatic but are quite relevant at this point. So, Karthikeya, would you want to uh, maybe highlight one or two of these questions, or even all of them? Uh, they could be answered together. So, Karthikeya's question is: What are the different ways of inviting, generating inquiries for archive material? That is marketing of it in some words. In other words, how do you reach out to the target group in the changing times using social media platforms? what kind of awareness campaigns can one design any examples if you could refer to he is specifically positioning his question from the reference of an architectural archive so one was to talk about physical and digital curation differently but here is a question where you are extending your physical archive into a digital space so what does that transition do Yeah. and and not only that uh, so that would also uh, be posing this new uh, a new set of processes that you have to now handle like mm. the dig the digital marketing campaigning and all this set of uh, yes. workflows becomes a part of uh, your engagement because i think ishita your work where you position yourself as curator and your uh, personal engagement with your uh, sources to get out the stories and everything i think th that sort of a process if you have to reimagine in the digital space it becomes a new role altogether and mm. then it becomes like oh my god th is this my job or should we get someone else who can do this better but all these things uh, like you know uh, for me i would say the digital i think uh, let me put this again as a disclaimer i think uh, it's a personal note so i mean to say the digital should be used as a tool like you know your digital campaigning or anything else will not going to be bringing just the change that you are looking forward for your personal engagement with your sources that whoever you are and how you reach out to them for that you might want to find them on twitter you might want to find them on instagram you might want to find them wherever else the opportunity are available but then it is not about these platforms it is the core thing is about you getting across that uh, that communication and campaigning uh, uh, you know core uh, reasons whatever why ever you wanted to do that is is that it it can't be like oh i tagged a hashtag and it's there and it's it will be like you know there's like 3 300000 views all that is not going to matter to 
uh, any of this, right? All these platforms, the way they give the analytics and all these things, that's that's not the thing that's going to change anything. The thing that's going to change is your personal uh, personal interaction, comfortability, getting friends, all these things that is, is my uh, thing. And I quite agree with Bhanu because that's what our experience is because digital medium, social media platforms or a website are just the tools uh, for us to engage with the larger kind of audience where we cannot reach. Uh, but when it comes to like, you know, uh, the direct stakeholders, for example, I work in a business archives. So there are like employees whom we are interacting with. Uh, so it's the personal rapport that we developed eventually. Uh, that actually really helps us. So when we began, uh, there was this little confusion among that business archives would be only about the achievements, about the milestones or say about, you know, the biggies in the corporates. Uh, but then when we started actually approaching the employees and he, when they uh, started, you know, understanding that even their diary will be important for the archives or, you know, uh, even a photograph of them in the office space or them celebrating, say, Diwali in the office. If even those narratives, personal stories are also going to be part of the uh, archive, then they started showing real interest. They thought, you know, that it's their story that is being put up there so i think this dialogue was like really necessary and we had to be like constantly in touch with the employees we had to be also in touch with the customers who have a lot of very interesting product stories you know there are like products like say store well or a refrigerator people have been using for 30 years and it's like you know they were treating these objects like uh, a family member so you know so when we started interacting we realized that there is an emotional connect with say cupboard you know and steel cupboard or steel almida and that was like you know fascinating story so these people you know you can't really ignore this whole connectivity with people because digital medium is going to be just the tool but then these stories you will be able to get so so then we started doing little exhibitions where we would involve employees uh, we started doing a lot of uh, you know lectures and the talks where they can understand you know different forms of history not just the business history but even how their personal archives is really very relevant. So these kind of dialogues we started doing in the organization. And that's when I think they started participating and contributing. So I think these personal interactions are really always important. And you have to be selling history all the time and make it interesting in different ways. So that's, that's I think, one of the skills that archivists need now. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Smithy, you have taken your work onto the digital quite a bit. How has that been as a response? Uh, I think that um, for me, the digit I use uh, digital storytelling as a way to preserve, uh, to preserve stories, narratives. Uh, that becomes my tool to actually see something. That becomes the lens. Um, but I think with my with the project that I've done, say like Darima, like Smriti, I use the digital uh, as a tool to preserve because I actually got rid of the physical objects. Mm. So uh, it really depends on what uh, what purpose that digital um, to what end you are using a certain tool. And the digital really is that tool. It's just a way of preserving, just as you would say photography. Uh, you know, where you uh, where it becomes a snapshot of something in time. And uh, how do you, you know? Um, yeah. So I think on a case by case basis, you have to sort of understand how you're employing, uh, what you're employing, and why. Yeah, and that changes. Yeah, and that, at least as an artist, it completely is shifting and changing. And actually, I'm I'm really glad we're having this conversation because I have not thought about it in the sense of anti-colonization, uh, which is really interesting, uh, Anuradha, that you brought that up, um, mm. just as a sort of methodology. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think. Historians of science and technology have, have you know, discussed this for a very long time, the idea that the technologies of digitization enable a kind of democratization of knowledge production. Mm -hmm. 
And so, but I, I, I sort of want to argue that we're talking about a couple of different things here. There is, and this is again getting at um, this difference between archiving, knowledge production, curation. These things, in a sense, have different purposes. I, I argue that these are always expressions of a constructed community. If we dig a little bit, we find out what that community is by looking at a thing and how it, you know, your, your work, um, it is a sort of narrative storytelling work, but you are, you're telling a story to a certain community. I mean, you have a certain idea in, you may not be articulating it, you have a certain um, idea of your audience in mind. Even if that audience is even a little bit abstracted because you don't know exactly who the audience is, you have a sensibility about who might want to hear this story. The, that to me, I mean, that's using your work anecdotally, but I think even if you extrapolate, if you scale that to something like a national uh, archive, the kinds of things that a national archive would accept. And the example that I used um, last week was um, the archive of Mokraj Anand, who the very famous writer who was a founder of the journal Marg. He became uh, the head of the um, one of the academies. Which academy? Um, I'm sorry. I'm just suddenly forgetting. But the he um you know his papers were given to the National Archive. They have never accessioned them. They have never prioritized making his papers available to the public, but they're sitting there, you know, in the National Archives building in Delhi, um, possibly getting lost, stolen, exposed to all kinds of elements, who knows what. And then we don't even know what's what will happen, you know, when they, if indeed they do redesign this whole thing. So um, it's a, it, these are things that I think um, get at some of the, divisions of, I mean, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that maybe we need to think in this conversation a little more rigorously about these, the ways that we're, we're imagining an archival process and whether the process of curating is something very different than the process of preserving, or whether we might just use that um, theoretical mm -hmm. distinction just to clarify our thinking even if we decide that ultimately they're not different, they serve the same purpose. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it completely makes sense. And I think that um, the idea of the audience becomes really interesting yes, yes. when, um, I mean, you, you can't make work and not think about the audience, especially even, you know, I think that my artistic process has been more rigorous because I'm an educator. Mm -hmm. And uh, you you have to think of audience as primary audience, secondary audience, tertiary audience, because then it becomes a bit more tangible rather than an intangible audience. You know, like uh, if an author writes an essay, who are you writing this for? Who who's going to read it? Who's going to know? Uh, personally, my work has always been the primary audience of my work is always the people whose stories I am telling, because as a storyteller, that's not my story. That story actually belongs to somebody else. I'm only a teller. Mm. So my, my first primary audience is actually the, the people whose stories I'm, I'm, I'm telling. And that becomes very important in democratizing the process of storytelling, right? That the people whose story, story I am taking the uh, liberty of telling um, should, have, should agree with me on the story that is being portrayed. Mm. Because otherwise, then I become a complete, uh, at least for me, that that's a very important part of my process. And um, so I will always put the story back into that community. Um, and once that it gets accepted there, then it's about saying, okay, now I, I can then, as an author of the story, then spread it to a secondary and a tertiary audience. Yeah, and, and then Very you don't nice know where that goes. And I, I'll still tell you that I focus my making of the work, keeping only my primary audience in mind, 
the second and tertiary is then not something that I know. And it always still baffles me that people will be interested in the work that I do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that does speak to an ethics. Um, and I would say that yeah. historians must mm -hmm. take on that ethics. I mean, I'm saying historians because they, they seem to be the primary people interacting with archives. Of course, many people interact with archives, people searching for their own family history, artists, architects. But if we think of this sort of discursive practice that a historian does to to be the storyteller of, of a larger body of, you know, whoever the people are. And the people don't have to be the people of a nation. They could be a smaller community. I mean, a historian really comes from a, a community. I do think that there's that, that this simple thing that you said that they must agree with the story I'm telling. That's a, not everybody takes that approach, obviously. And I think that that approach is so crucial. That is really the fundamental issue at stake here. Thank you, Smriti. Thank you, Anuradha. Um, uh, I mean, I just wanted to add one I just, point uh, we were talking about uh, was about um, this whole just a thought. I, I don't even have a question here is all about um, the logic of preservation and how much space do we need for it and how much space do we have for it. So while I still agree with what Rinda and um, um, Banu were trying to sort of um, assert on the need to understand digital as a tool, but somewhere it has become a space for some of the projects I've been referring to or the way we have been curating it because politics of land is a very real situation that cultural heritage or heritage preservation is dealing with. Uh, I've seen enough situations of museums or of archives inside uh, the buildings to know that uh, either manpower or either uh, land or either the resources for it are serious concerns. And you then resort to advising or you know sharing ideas with them, which is to say, could it be digitally preserved so they can, sorry, but yeah, get rid of things which can be gotten rid of uh, with, with the with, you know, stone on my heart. But but these have been very real conversations. Um, uh, not everybody has that leisure of space or leisure of building institutions. And that's a very contextual scenario. Um, uh, I just, yeah, I wanted to put that out there and ask Karthik if his question was covered and he's replied that it is, okay. Uh, so, oh, over to you, Apan. Ishita, may I respond to what you just raised? Yes, yes, um, please. Sorry, Aparna, just, uh, I'll just quickly intervene. I mean, I think it's really great that you raised the politics of land. And then in, in the context of this, the issue of the virtual, if we, you know, think about particularly not just the digital, but the internet as a as a kind of space, though in the way that land was, I mean, the biggest thing that the internet did, in a way, socially, the biggest thing it did, um, and again, referring to this concept of the democratization of a space, is that it enabled a lot of people to make interventions who couldn't make interventions in real space precisely because they were not landed, the, precisely because of the politics of wealth that is, you know, created capitalistically by, by the way that land is used and divided and owned and capitalized on. And I think that the virtual space created a whole new field of ways for people to monetize things and do things that were and I mean, archive things like like create wealth in different ways or create power in different ways. Um, all of this, in some ways, what the you know could could form resistances or oppositions to the power structures that I think were played out in 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 the real world based on landed politics. But I think that we have to also be very cognizant and careful about the way certain power structures are formed in virtual space because in some ways they do replicate you know the actual power structures mm -hmm. that you're referring to when you're talking about politics of land 
And in some ways, they create entirely new ones along the same model. And these are things that I think we might really think about in... And I think that, again, the weirdly, the, um, the proving ground for all of this and the stakes for all of this is in something like an archive, in those spaces where we create repositories. And those spaces that are virtual, where repositories are created, they gain a kind of value. I think as we've all experienced in different ways, the ways in which we see knowledge gathered online, you know, information is whatever, you know, money is power, knowledge is money, information is whatever. I think we all see the ways that we're, that in, information gets translated directly into a kind of wealth. And these repositories become really important for that. Yes, Anuradha, I completely agree <clears throat> with that point. And I think I had asked this question to Dinesh and team when we were looking at the digital as well, that it does create its own um, ways of marginalizing, its own limitations uh, of not reaching out to a certain audience, those who don't have internet and tech. Um, and I think, yeah, it's. It, I don't have an answer, as I said. It's just that both sides sort of have its own uh, merits or perhaps a need as well. Okay, Aparna, I think we have held you on for no two uh, So, so since you... we were talking about, you know, the knowledge producing apparatus uh, part, you know, uh, it is very important because, you know, that's again the colonial concept of, you know, looking at an archive or a museum, uh, especially in the imperial way. The same way if we look, you know, most of the national institutions we have in India are, you know, by virtue, you only have, you know, being employed by a government organization. And then again, you know, what the government organization tries to portray to you as heritage is, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, narrative you create. Like, uh, this is a paper which I actually did on IGNCA, you know, last month for one of the, you know, uh, you know, coursework over here. So again, like, you know, in the same imperial way, I think an institution like IGNCA, which is neither a museum, neither an archive, neither, you know, a library, but, you know, it, it works on a hybridization model of everything and acts as a collecting, you know, repository, and then they create their own narratives of culture. Uh, I mean, framing them as a cultural institution. So, I mean, it's, it's the same way all the digital content, I mean, you have this digital content which can, you know, just create stories or create narratives. So, you know, there is essentially, you know, the uh, archival component, you know, is like, lost over there because it's just a repository yeah, question. i mean when you are creating narratives it's out of repositories it's not out of archives i mean the archival concept is totally different that's what i would like to say because i'm like studying hardcore archiving right now and like i i absolutely detest this you know thing of putting digital everywhere and you know digital curation you know uh you know coming in and you know uh you know, kind of messing around, I would rather say. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, the core archival values are completely different and how archives, libraries, museums, everything has a different mission to do with the records. And even, I mean, the technology is kind of blurring it, I believe. But, uh, I mean, we need to still understand that the functions of, you know, all the different, you know, fields within, you know, uh, you know, these kind of collecting institutions will remain different. Hmm. That's all I would I, like to say. No, I completely agree with you, Aparna, because coming from the archivist uh, point of view, yeah, no, no, coming from the archivist point of view, I completely understand what Aparna is trying to say, uh, because, you know, that day only we were discussing that how archiving, the word archiving is being used really very leniently. Uh, and uh, means I, I, I'm, for actually the digital content and digital again is the medium for me uh, but you know all the back end work that you need for creating such kind of narratives is what archiving is all about you know like you need those databases to be there on the digital platform so that more and more can access them so yeah. and i so, narratives so, are only i think i think yeah. one face of the archives that can reach people but you need all that you know back end work and it's quite rigorous as aparna has also said
Yeah, so is, unless yeah. your archive exists, your metadata exists, exactly. there cannot be digital curation happening. Yeah. So, you know, the first step is to, you know, uh, kind of sustain the archive itself. Like, that's why I'm saying a lot of these talks, which I've been attending on Mili, as well as, you know, this particular platform, I'm just like bored out of during, you know, my summer internship just started two days back. But, you know, uh, it's like, you know, I was bored, you know, in between for about two, three weeks. I'm so glad, you know, I just signed up for some forum. You know, it kind of acts as a catalyst to understand many things. I believe we have a basic lack of understanding even in what is tangible heritage. Like, you know, we are talking about architecture and archiving that that focuses more on tangible heritage. Whereas when we come to objects or, you know, uh, audio visual material that comes to intangible heritage. So the root causes we are not even understanding, you know, that when we start with any educational, you know, initiative, perhaps, you know, in heritage, we need to kind of, you know, focus on these differences as well. Which I think hopefully if Venkat is listening to it, I think, you know, Mili Network needs to kind of make that distinction too. Like, you know, tangible heritage archiving, intangible heritage archiving, everything is going to be different. Thanks, Aparna. Banu, I think you wanted to say something here. Can we take no, I think Aparna, yeah, Aparna uh, voiced it out well. I think I was just about to come across a similar point. But I think uh, also I just wanted to clarify to you also that uh, the question that you post about the digital reach and uh, uh, you know those uh, uh, campaigning mm. and those things for that where i said the digital was the tool but again mm. the digital as a space and the land apart that what that we were talking like that is another space right i mean uh, there here it was about communication campaigning reach out and that but when we are speaking about the digital space itself then it's uh, it's going to be like Say for example, you have a you have a inscription, and the inscription is transcribed on your Word Word document. It's digitized. Okay, that's one layer of digitization. Then you can take a photograph of that, or, or a very high resolution photograph. That's another thing. Then you can take a 3D reconstruction of the of the inscription itself. That's another thing. So within that digital space. As, as to how we are seeing it as a mechanism to preserve and stuff, there's a lot of range of stuff. So I think uh, it would take another uh, series for us to uh, delve into that probably. Uh, but but then again, yeah, like I would like to vouch and uh, vote plus one for what Aparna has raised about uh, uh, about about this digital being uh, very intro like. Uh, uh, like I think it's it's the attitude of the of the like how Facebook break fast build more like you know like you you build you keep building and you yeah. break it and you know you know that where it will break and you know you get started next that's how fast the digital uh, uh, you know services domain like all our social media and all of that is running and and then again all the panelists I think I voiced out this that the word archive being leniently used is because of i feel that the new generation which is coming into the space are also seeing the new things that are happening in this world right i think their understanding is being influenced by this new uh, new culture that we are setting up for uh, for for the future is to look at us, look back at us hmm. that's a very uh, strong thought to end this conversation with i think yes we need to understand the present technology present times uh, and what is now to come i don't know at least personally for myself it's very hazy thanks to the covid but i think our response to archiving is perhaps a, a very timely uh, or a time oriented conversation and i think uh, we do want to continue, Bhanu. So yes, we can ideate on another series on this, make it more um, subject content specific as well. Um, this was a broader conversation to begin and uh, more define, uh, they find ways to define the practice and the content and the curriculum for Indian and South Asian contexts. So any other last comments from the speakers? Anything that they would 
want to add or else i can move on to the thank yous i i just wanted to speak for venkat about mili that aparna raised i think uh, that yeah uh -huh. yes aparna that uh, the all intangible tangible different different kinds of archiving when we said even institutional community archives they are themselves a broad uh, way of looking at archives and mili definitely is willing to look at this broad and diverse uh, practices and in saying so we are not saying that that we will be the custodian of taking care of that uh, that thing we are saying that the practitioner will collaborate with us in looking at yes uh, at these things yeah i ishita <clears throat> i would yes. just like to, i would like to echo a desire for continuing this conversation i mean really it's <laughs> such a, it's everyone is coming from such um very interesting backgrounds and it's really amazing yeah. to collect this group of people together i don't know yeah. how everyone's schedules permit but i would really be happy to yes and apart from uh, these 47 registrations we had received we also got a lot of continuing interest from people who couldn't make it for this week but do want to be in loop of such conversations and uh, speaking for myself or the collective i we also do want to keep doing something at least once a month uh, and find ways to connect back and keep discussing these questions um so what i'm going to share is a very basic google form there are not many detailed questions it's just a uh, anonymous space for people to put in their thoughts um which i'm going to share on the whatsapp group but also over email so once we have more feed forward from um the participants of this session it will sort of help us curate program plan what comes forward um as something which happens monthly i guess maybe week long maybe spread across 10 days 15 days something just once a day we might explore more options and again it doesn't have to be us so the reason i keep saying collective is um one of you could sort of spearhead the next one um, all mm -hmm. ideas coming from one brain is impossible trust me <laughs> so uh, we totally want to sort of leverage this platform to more practitioners in this field uh, already starting with the 47 members who have registered with us so if any of one of you sort of wants to take on what happens in july we are happy to discuss and work along with you make the platform available and um, take it forward so that's that's how we are researching okay so with that uh, very quick thank yous um thank you to again wallabi i mean i can't thank her enough um she's she's just come on board immediately when i proposed this this is about a month back and it's just been amazing working with her uh, many thanks to all the participants of this series as well as all the speakers you all also sort of signed up at quite a short notice i guess 15 days was still short and listening through engaging being there right now it's taken more than 2 hours and you're still around and bringing in different views and ideas so sort of you know these contestation differences are very important uh, i also have to thank the participants of the online engagement three sessions so about 30 participants of curating family archives um i think you guys sort of uh, built this confidence into me but also into developing or shaping this collective um and some of you are here but most of you would sort of access this material through video so we hope to keep doing these online engagements more and uh, yeah um last but not the least let's stay in touch um for curating for culture the instagram handle is curating for culture you have our email address um and we'll send you in the email with the feed forward form we'll also send you a request um about allowing us to share your details uh, with each other if yes. allowed then we'll just take these two columns from the um, excel sheet which sort of gets generated from the registration form um we will exchange it across and not put emails in bcc but put it in cc so everybody can see each other know who they are apart from the introductions we had today because i still do know a lot of people did miss out today's session so yeah it'd be nice for all of us to know all 47 and stay in touch thank you for making this possible